Hey everyone, and welcome back to Build UX. In this how-to, we're gonna look at how to design flexible button components in Figma with a really simple approach using auto layout. Here in Figma, we're revisiting some older design files that we have from a past how-to that relied on layout constraints in order to make flexible button components. But now with auto layout, this whole process is so much simpler and allows for a ton of new possibilities. So diving right in, we have our color palette, which is already vetted for sufficient color contrast in terms of accessibility. We have our button text type spec, and here are the settings for that. We have IBM Plex Sans, semi bold, 20 pixel font size, and 28 pixel line height. A new addition is we have these small icon components because we're gonna demonstrate how to incorporate icons into the buttons as well. So the first thing I'd like to address is all the different approaches we can take with auto layout and allow you to pick whatever you like best. So diving right in, let's hit T for the type tool and let's type out some text of watch now that'll act as our button text. We're gonna select all of this text and make sure we apply our text style of button text. Now a really cool thing about auto layout is it's super easy to enable. So all we have to do is hold shift and A and you'll see that this was already converted into an auto layout frame. On the right, we have this auto layout panel with all of the settings that we want. So for a horizontal padding, we have 24 pixels, vertical is gonna be 16, and then let's anticipate having some icons in this button as some variations. So let's start out with a horizontal spacing between elements of eight. And with that, all we have to do is actually enable a fill color. So let's just choose some gray as an example for now. And basically we already have a flexible component. So if we were to type out some longer text, you see that everything updates dynamically and really mimics the padding or box model behavior of actual HTML and CSS. So that's really cool. And technically this is already a button that we could use in our design system. So I'd probably just rename this layer to be the button text. And I would componentize this frame and that would be plenty to get you going with a simple button approach. Let's incorporate some icons into this just to show how powerful this new feature is. So let's drag in a previous and next icon. Obviously we wouldn't want both enabled at the same time, but what's really cool is we can actually just enable or disable these as needed. And we may have to adjust some of the layout constraints. So let's make sure that everything is vertically centered. And with that, you can actually enable whatever variation you need. So a text only button, a right icon variation, you may have to sometimes adjust that alignment when you bring it back into play. And we also have a left icon variation as well. So we'll keep it simple for now, but it's really cool that we can just enable that and everything is dynamically updated. So this is the first option and it works well for a really straightforward button, but let's look at something that is a little bit more robust and better simulates the actual accessibility needs that we'll have to design for. So one critical thing about buttons is accounting for their focus state. Basically when the button receives keyboard focus, we have to have some sort of dedicated focus indicator to show where the keyboard is currently focused. So to make this possible, typically this would be some sort of outline or ring around the interactive element. And right now this frame really is acting as our button plate. So one cool thing is we can actually just hit shift A once more to enable another nested layout grid. And this one also has its own dedicated padding settings as well as horizontal alignment. So since because there's no items within this, we can set that spacing between to zero. And I think this padding of eight all around is gonna work well. Now the next thing we would do is simply add a stroke. And let's just set this to be our dark charcoal color here and make it four pixels thick. Now this actually already shows what a focus indicator would look like. One limitation here though, is that these auto layout layers or frames must match the sizing of their internal contents. So typically focus indicators don't actually affect the layout of an element. So we would want this plate layer to be the actual constraints of this. But you can see right now, all of our measurements, if we select this outermost layer, are going off of this focus indicator. So this is a second option, but I'd like to go one step further and really explore what's possible here. So dragging out this third instance, let's call this button focus indicator, just so we can keep things organized. 
and I'll do the same on this other instance down here. Now what I'd like to do is restrict the layout dimensions of this to the actual button itself instead of the focus outline. So we can actually wrap this in a frame now. I'm gonna hit Control or Command plus Alt or Option and G to actually wrap this in a frame. And what I'll do is using Shift and the arrow keys, I'm gonna nudge it up by eight pixels and nudge it to the left eight pixels as well. And that tucks it into the top left corner of our frame. Then I'm gonna drag this frame into place and you'll see that basically the component sizing is now based off of the actual interactive element instead of the focus indicator. So now when it comes time to space it off of other components, we can actually componentize this now and let's call this our button. And as we drag out new instances, you'll see that the spacing is again based on the actual layout that would happen in HTML and CSS. So this is my preferred workflow at the moment. Now, it might be a little extra maintenance because although these components are still flexible with longer text, as you can see, our plate and our focus indicator are resizing nicely. Let me just get that to fit there. One limitation is that our outermost frame at the component layer won't come along for the ride. So one thing you would have to do is drag it out to match that edge. I'm willing to incorporate just a little bit extra effort to basically simulate the actual layout of this component and make laying these out quickly much easier because now you can actually focus on the spacing between elements and that will always be based off the actual button plate. So those are some different options when using auto layout to make some flexible components. And any of these at any point, you can engage with different icons as needed and everything will update accordingly. So with these different options in mind, I'll leave it up to you which one you'd like to incorporate in your own work. But for the purposes of this how-to, let's follow this last option here, which incorporates a frame for proper sizing. So I'm actually gonna move this over to our buttons documentation here and get everything spaced appropriately. Now with this, I'm gonna rename this to button. This will be a primitive instance and this will be the default state. Now with this, we're using some generic grays at first just to show that this is really an initial reference, but it's not necessarily in the context of our branding or theming. Next up, let's show how we would actually get different instances of components ready for hover and focus state, and then for the various themes that we'd like to have using our color palette. So the first thing is our focus indicator for this default state actually won't have any stroke. And you can see that our button sizing now makes a lot more sense with that frame wrapped around it. I'd like to drag out a copy of this and let's rearrange this layer so it's at the bottom of our stack. And this will be for the hover state. Now again, we're just working with some rough colors here just as an example. We would brighten up our background color and then we could recomponentize this and call it hover. Lastly, dragging out another instance, we would want to show that focus indicator. So we bring back our stroke. That was the dark charcoal color that we have here. And then we'd like to match our hover state over to our focus state. And we could componentize this, calling it focus. Now, just to reinforce this concept, we can drag out another instance of our default state using our primitive. And let's start thinking through some actual theming now. So our button plate, for example, we could use this birch color. We'll componentize this. And instead of primitive, we could rename it for the birch theme. Dragging out a new instance, we'll get our hover state established. So we'll change this plate color to our light cobalt. We will recomponentize this layer and call this the hover state. And lastly, same thing as before, getting our focus state accounted for. We'll grab our focus indicator, we'll enable the stroke and set its color to that same cobalt. We'll grab our plate and match it over to our hover style. Componentize that and say that it's focus. So that's a quick example of how we would take our primitive instance and re-theme it for the colors that would actually be used in our designs. 
Now I'm going to speed things up and complete our other two color themes and then we'll check in to see just how flexible these components are using them across the board throughout a design system or any project. All right, with all of these instances complete, you can see that as a project evolves, you probably will end up with many color variations, but a great thing about having a proper component structure is it's easy to maintain the styling of all these in one central location. So for example, we can go to our primitive instance here, and let's say we actually want more of a rounded look to these buttons. So we'll add an eight pixel border radius, and then the focus indicator we can also update with 16 pixels so it matches that look. And we only have to maintain one instance for all these, which is really handy. And we can also go into any of the instances or variations in our designs and customize things as needed. So we can enable an icon on the right side or on the left side, for example. And we can go into the text of any instance and update it as needed. And everything will update dynamically. So that's it for this how-to. I hope you found it helpful. And there's a link in the description to this Figma file so you can check it out on your own. There's going to be many more how-tos coming out soon with Figma, auto layout, as well as all the various design and development topics that we cover on Build UX. Thank you so much for watching and be sure to look out for the next how-to.